Hi, this video is kind of like a summary of interesting statistics that I have assembled over the month. There are separate videos on each of those graphs that you're going to see here. But if you just want to get a bit of an overview, learn a thing or two about Bitcoin and maybe its correlations to other assets, its volatility over time, its performance by time of the day, things like that. If you find those kind of topics interesting, this is the video for you. So what you see over here as the first graph is Bitcoin's average return in the last one and a half years by hour of the day. And with hour of the day, we mean the UTC time zone. So what you can see is that from four to five o'clock UTC, we typically on average have pretty stark negative performance. And then we basically go like in waves and the end of the day typically is rather positive. So this candle over here is pretty interesting, right? Why is the return from four to five so negative? And my gut tells me it might be market manipulation. Look at the trading volume chart. This is Bitcoin's trading volume by hour of the day. And we can see that at four o'clock trading volume typically is relatively low. And I think this negative candle over here and the low trading volume during this time of the day is no coincidence. Because let's say you want to manipulate the market, right? Let's say you have an interest that Bitcoin sharply drops. So maybe you're an exchange that offers leveraged trading and you want your traders to get liquidated, right? So that you can get the profits of those liquidations. So you want the price to quickly drop and then recover again. And when do you want to do this? You want to do this when there is very little trading activity because then order books tend to be thin. So there's not a lot of buying and selling orders already in the book. And so when you then start selling off a lot of Bitcoin and you do this during a time of low activity, you tend to impact the price much more than if you were trying to attempt to manipulate the market during those very busy times. And so that's just one thing to look out for, right? If you trade on leverage, make sure you are not too close to a potential liquidation from four to five o'clock AM UTC time. That's at least when in the past, the big liquidations happened when the big drops in the Bitcoin price happened. Now, when we talk about volatility and we talk about average price movements, like how much does the Bitcoin price move. There's a historical trend. Historically, the price movements of Bitcoin in relative terms, in percentage terms, they get less intense, right? So the price fluctuates less. So 10 years ago, a 20% change in price of Bitcoin on a day wouldn't be so special compared to when that happens today. Now I've done an analysis to actually measure that. So the way I looked at this is I looked at the daily price changes, right? So on one day, the price of Bitcoin goes up by say 9%. On another day, the price goes down by say 20%. And what you can do with this chart, you can basically flip it, right? You can flip the bottom half of this chart to the top. So then the chart looks like this, right? So we've just now flipped the chart. And now with this chart, we have a measure of volatility, not the standard measure, right? Usually you would take the price changes and square them. But for this exercise, for this illustrative example, I think it's sufficient. So we've got now a measure of volatility, the absolute price changes per day. And instead of looking just at a month of price data, what we have over here, you can draw this chart for all of Bitcoin's history. And when you do this, you get this chart. So on some days, we've got a lot of price change, 50%. On other days, we have rather little movements. We barely cross the 10% mark of price changes on a day. Now let's draw a regression line through this. That's what we get. We get this red line here. And we can already see it does decline. So there is a tendency of decreased volatility in Bitcoin. Now, in order to see how much it declined, we have to zoom in. Let's do that. So we're now basically just looking at 0 to 5%. We are zooming in 0 to 5%. We've got our regression line. And we see that on average, the price movements decreased from 3.5% to now around 2.5%. Another way to look at this is instead of using a regression line, you could just take a moving average, right? You could average out the price fluctuations and draw a trend with a moving average. 
And so instead of getting a regression line, you get a moving average line. And this is how it looks like. This is the one year moving average. Now there's still quite a bit of fluctuation in here. So let's average further. This is the two year, this is the three year, and this is the four year moving average. So maybe we take the three year. Also here we can see volatility declined from around three and a half percent to currently two and a half percent average price change per day. What I find interesting about this is that Bitcoin during this time became several orders of magnitudes larger, right? It grew from a few cents to a few dollars to now thousands of dollars. And so what's interesting is that actually I would have expected that volatility decreases much more, relatively speaking, not just from like three and a half to two and a half percent, but that the change in volatility would be much more pronounced simply because the asset as a whole, the market cap as a whole has increased that much. But we don't see that, right? So what I would expect is that given volatility didn't go down that much, that the trading opportunities within Bitcoin, timing the market, buying the bottoms and selling the tops, the kind of returns you can achieve are still relatively attractive. Not as great as they used to be, but still not bad at all. Now, one thing that's interesting is let's compare this to other assets. Let's look at gold's volatility and the S&P 500's volatility so that we can just grasp how much or how little this volatility here in Bitcoin actually is. So this is the corresponding volatility for gold. Again, a scale from zero to five with a moving average, four year moving average. And we see the daily price changes are less than 1%. The same scale for Bitcoin we are always above two and a half percent. So this is the exact same scale. I'm toggling now between gold and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is way more volatile than gold. And there seems to be still a very long way to go until we are that much matured in Bitcoin to really call this a gold 2.0, a store of value, something that you can buy and forget and where you don't have really large drops anymore. It's very likely that we are still gonna get major crashes in Bitcoin simply because the volatility itself, it hasn't calmed down that much. This here, by the way, is the average daily price fluctuation of the S&P 500. So also below 1%. So S&P 500, gold, Bitcoin. S&P 500, gold, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is in a completely different league in terms of price risk, in terms of volatility. Now, I personally think it's smart not to only own crypto. It's probably good to diversify to own other kinds of assets. And that's because of correlation. You want to have long-term appreciating assets that gain in value over time, but that don't move in the same direction at the same time. So when one of your asset classes crashes, the other stays stable. And so your overall portfolio doesn't fluctuate too much in value. And what you can see over here is the correlation coefficient between Bitcoin and the S&P 500. So this is a two year moving average. So the daily returns, the correlation of the daily returns averaged out over a two year window and then plotted along over time. And we do see that the correlation is increasing over time. So Bitcoin nowadays tends to move more in tandem with the general stock market, with the S&P 500, but it's still relatively low, right? So when we are at a zero correlation, that means the assets move completely independent from one another. There's no real influence. If we are at one, it means the assets always move in the same direction. If we are at minus one, they always move in opposite directions. And what you ideally want is when you have a portfolio to own assets that are either negatively correlated or at least have a very low correlation. So the lower this line here on this graph is between two assets, the better they are for combining in a portfolio. So the idea is rather simple, right? This is asset A and this is asset B and they move basically in very similar directions. And if you would combine those two in a portfolio, right, high correlation, we get a portfolio that basically has the same kinds of movements. 
we also have these potential downturns simply because both of our assets, they lose value at the same time. But if on the other hand, you have an uncorrelated asset or let's say even a negatively correlated asset, so it tends to actually move in the opposite direction. It still appreciates, but it tends to move in the opposite direction to your other asset. If you now combine those two in a portfolio, you have a pretty much straight portfolio line. And that's what you want, right? You want an appreciating portfolio, a portfolio that goes up in price, but that doesn't have the fluctuations. You can also say you want to optimize your share ratio, your reward versus risk. You get the reward, but you don't get the price fluctuation. You don't get the risk. And you achieve this with low correlation between two assets. And so if you look now at the correlation between Bitcoin and the S&P 500, we see it's unfortunately slightly increasing over time. But it still makes sense to diversify your existing stock portfolio with crypto because if you just look at correlations within stocks, so say you currently have a stock portfolio, if you look at the correlations within stocks, you see a much higher correlation coefficient. So this is Apple to the S&P 500. So there we see a correlation coefficient somewhere between 0 0.4 and 0 0.7, also of the tendency that the correlation coefficient increases over time, but it's still way higher than what Bitcoin has. So just as a diversifier, it does make sense to own some crypto simply to balance out the price fluctuations that you get into your stock portfolio. So this is pretty good, right? A correlation coefficient of around 0 0.2. Now, how well can you diversify your crypto price fluctuations within the crypto space. So say instead of only having Bitcoin, you also buy Ethereum, you also buy other altcoins. What's actually the correlation coefficient between cryptos? There you go. This is an analysis I've done recently on basically all the price history I had on a few altcoins. So Bitcoin to Ethereum correlates with 0 0.75, Bitcoin to Cardano 0 0.68, and to the smaller altcoins we are looking at 0 0.4, 0 0.5. On average, we see a correlation somewhere between 0 0.4 to maybe 0 0.6. So those are relatively high correlations. It's similar what we can see within the stock market, right? Between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, 0 0.7 correlation coefficient. So you actually do not diversify very well when you just buy crypto and you buy different crypto assets and try to reduce your overall price fluctuations in the portfolio. You really have to step out of the asset class. You have to diversify between asset classes. So it's much better to buy an S&P 500 ETF and some Bitcoin rather than buying some Ethereum and some Bitcoin. You reduce your overall price fluctuations much more by going between different asset classes. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of trying to diversify by buying a lot of different altcoins, by buying a lot of different cryptos. One reason, obviously, being that the correlation between the crypto assets is pretty high. But another reason is that I think the crypto market is still comparatively young. And as such, there seems to still be some kind of concentration process happening. The altcoins that are hip today are pretty likely not going to be hip and trendy in two or three years. And to make this point, I have looked at the coin market cap ranking three years ago. And so look at this. At the top, we've got Bitcoin and Ethereum. Okay, fair enough. But then we've also got quite a few coins, Stellar, Litecoin, IOTA, Dash, Monero, that nowadays they are not anymore in the top 20. NEM, Ontology. So nowadays the top 20 coins, they look quite different, right? Here, so let's look at this. On the right side, we've got the ones of today. On the left side, we've got the ones three years ago. So Ripple was on number three. Ripple nowadays is at number seven, okay? Bitcoin Cash from four to 12. EOS is now at 28. Litecoin went from six to 14. Stella from seven to 20. Cardano is probably doing very well, went from 8 to 5. But now the smaller we go, the riskier it gets, right? IOTA from 9 to place 43, Tron from 10 to 25, NEO is now at place 41. We won't count Tether, that's a stable coin. Dash took a hit, place 13 to 62. And so you get the picture, right? A lot of those coins that were the top coins three years ago 
they did come down quite a bit. And that's not just in terms of relative market rank, but also in terms of price, right? So for example, here Dash was at $272. Now it's at 125. So the additional risk you take on by buying all those comparatively small altcoins, I mean, these were the top 20 coins that we just looked at, but already just going down this list over here, you tend to underperform the market. You tend to underperform Bitcoin and you don't get a lot of diversification benefit from it. Your correlation coefficient is pretty high. So the way I see this is altcoins are probably good for short-term trades to find inefficiencies, to see if there's some kind of mispricing between assets and just make some profit based on a strategy. But for long-term holding and for long-term diversification, I would probably stick with the very top coins, right? Like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano. Dogecoin is obviously questionable. Binance coin, who knows where Binance is? There are question marks around how the centralized exchange is going to handle all the regulatory problems. And so for everything below Cardano, I would probably be careful holding this long term, at least if your idea is just to diversify. If you want to diversify so you have less overall portfolio volatility, it's best to simply look at different assets, stocks, property, and crypto. And if you find the right balancing between those assets that match your general risk appetite, then you've probably already half won, at least for the long term. And obviously, one of the holy grail questions is how much of each of those assets should you own? And that depends on many circumstances, right? How much are you willing to lose potentially? How much price fluctuations can you take? Are you pretty young in your career? So if there is a big drop, do you have a lot of time to just regain back that money, just redeploying it back in? Or is your asset pool already so large that your cash flows maybe through a regular job, they're relatively small compared to your assets. And thus when it really goes down a lot and you have a lot of volatility in your overall portfolio, you couldn't really take advantage of the drop because simply in relative terms, the new money you deploy wouldn't matter so much. So you need to have these kind of thoughts, right? Do you want to retire? Can you digest larger drops? If your wealth is still relatively small, I would say less than five years of cash flow, then you're probably good to take quite a bit of risk, maybe 10, maybe 20% in crypto in like the big cryptos. But if you've already got like 10 years salary or 10 years of your cash flow saved up, say in house equity and in your 401k and all of that combined, then you probably don't want to shift too much into very risky assets because simply when it goes down, you can't really catch up that easily. You can't really utilize drops that well. There's one more chart I want to show you, something I found very interesting. So this is Bitcoin's performance by month of the year over the last 10, 11 years. And what's interesting is how we can see quite a nice pattern that the autumn tends to be pretty weak. So the next month, they might be weak for Bitcoin as well. Who knows if history repeats itself, but they tend to be weak. And then the last quarter of the year tends to be strong. The spring tends to be strong as well. So there could be all kinds of explanations for this, right? This could just be completely random. But what I tend to think is since crypto is still so young and since there's not a lot of professional money in the market, this might just have something to do with attention on crypto. So maybe people just don't stay at home that much during the summer months. They go out, they don't look at price charts all the time. And so maybe just by having less attention, there's less purchases happening and thus less price appreciations. And then once it gets cold again, performance picks up and then everybody obviously is very excited during the spring. There's even a saying in the stock market, right? Sell in May and go away. So I haven't done the same analysis for stocks, but if that saying has any merit in history, there might be a similar pattern happening for stocks as well. So sell in May and go away might not be the worst advice for Bitcoin as well. But yeah, there's a lot of ways to look at timing the market in Bitcoin. This is probably not the perfect approach, but it's still nice to have this in the back of the head to have an idea of how Bitcoin generally tends to perform throughout the year. If you enjoyed this content, feel free to give this video a like so YouTube shares it to a new audience. If you haven't yet, feel free to subscribe as well. 
I publish videos two to three times every week. And last but not least, we've got a small Telegram channel that you can join as well. It's completely spam-free and we discuss crypto topics over there. See you next time. Bye-bye.